here at Malden. We're glad each one of you out with us this morning. Hope each one of you picked up a bulletin. I'm not going over all the things in the bulletin. Just remember our shut-ins that's in our bulletin, our sick. Also, uh, let's remember Deborah Clark. She's at home now. Her, they said her surgery was successful. Hope she can recover and be back with us. Also, let's remember Joe Mormon. He had failed and was in the emergency room. Wednesday for probably six or seven hours. So let's remember yeah. him also. And also uh, Diane Fairclough, she's her knee, the doctor recommended she not to get up on her knee right now. So let's remember her, uh, that her knee she can recover from. Or she has, you know, let them see what they need to do for her. Also, uh, this afternoon, our men's business meeting will be at 4.30, so men, remember that if you can be here, it'll be at 4.30 this afternoon. Into our worship today, our song leader will be with Joel Foster, our scripture reading Rusty Maddox, our lesson by Dennis Strine, our closing prayer by Joel Maddox, and we'll begin our services with opening prayer will be with Michael Firecloud. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord God, 
great and holy are you above all. There is none greater than you. We are so thankful that you are God. We are so thankful that you are righteous, that there is no evil in you, and that you exemplify goodness. We are thankful that you are our God, and that we can be your children, and that you have given us everything we need to live a godly life. We're thankful that you are our creator. We're thankful for this beautiful world that you have given to us. We thank you for the beautiful mountains and the woods and the oceans and the beaches and all that we have in this world. We thank you for the fact that you have given this to us and you've given us dominion over it. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards of everything that you have given us. We thank you for this time of worship that you have blessed us with. Yes. We're so thankful that we can be here to be with one another, to sing praises to you, to come to you in prayer, to gather around your table, to remember your son, and to hear your word proclaimed. We thank you for your presence here on this day. We know that you are here with us as we gather together. Help us always to believe that and understand that, that we are indeed in your presence this morning. We ask that our worship be done in spirit and truth and be always pleasing to you. We ask that you be with those that are sick on this day, that you watch over them and care for them and restore them to their health. We're also mindful of those that have chosen not to be here because of spiritual issues that you use the events of life to help them to recognize that they are in need of you. We know there's a lot of people in this world that have turned their backs on you. We ask that you Again, use the events of life and use us to be able to reach out to them, to teach them about you, so that they can have the opportunity to give their lives to you. We're thankful for your son who so willingly came to this earth, who willingly allowed himself to be sacrificed on that cross for our sin. He died for each of us not for his sins, but ours. We're thankful that he was willing to endure this. And we're thankful that you watched down upon this and allowed it to happen. We know when we see other people that we love being hurt, we want to do everything in our power to stop it. And as you look down upon him being crucified on that cross, we know that in your heart you were crying for him as you saw his pain and agony. But yet, you still allowed it to happen because of the great love that you have for each one of us. Help us always to remember that you loved us, that you love us, and that you love us enough for your son to die on that cross for each of us. Help us to remember that, not just on this day, but all the days of our lives. Help us to walk with you, be one with you, and to live a life in a way that pleases you and your son. We thank you for all you do for us every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Lordy. Me. Two, nine, one. Two, nine, one. <clears throat> I know not my God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know Supper, how deep the Father's love. How deep the Father's love. <clears throat> how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all Thank you. 
7 it tells us and upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread Paul preached unto them ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight so that tells us there that's when we're supposed to take of uh, this communion of uh, the bread and the fruit of the vine it says take up on the first day of the week if you would I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 11 23 through 26 for I have received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. We'll now have the prayer for the bread. Our kind Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to partake of this bread, which represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we as Christians partake of this in a manner pleasing unto thee. Christ's name we pray. Amen. I continue your prayer for the fruit of the vine. Yes, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we take the this cup, share this bread, and the cross of Calvary. The one feast, this one give it to us. That's very right, honest.
concludes the Lord's Supper. Another part of our worship service is given back to the Lord as He's blessed each and every one of us with. If you would, I'd like to read 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, and it reads, Every man according as his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth cheerful giving. We'll now have a prayer for our offering. Our kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for our homes, our families, our jobs. Thank you for the church here. We pray as we give back to you, that we'll give back in a manner that is, that is pleasing in thy sight. Christ, I'm going to pray. Five nine nine. Five nine nine. <coughs> Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, trying to follow our Savior and King, shaping our lives by His blessed example. Happy, how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light. Stepping in the light, how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light, pressing more closely to Him who is leading when we are tempted to turn from the way, trusting the arm that is strong to defend us, Happy, how happy, our praises each day. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Walking in footsteps of gentle forbearance, footsteps of faithfulness, mercy, and love. Looking to Him for the grace freely promised, happy, how happy, our journey above. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, Stepping in the light, stepping in the light, how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light, trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, upward still upward we'll follow our guide. When we shall see him, the king, in his beauty, happy, how happy, our place at his side. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, let it 
speaks to us two eight four two eight four it's convenient we ask you to stand I know that my redeemer liveth and his throne shall ever stand I know Grace and power are in his hand. I know, I know that Jesus liveth and that his throne shall ever stand. I know, I know that life he giveth, that grace and power is in They cannot die, though cruel death my flesh may sail, yet shall I see him by and by. I know, I know that Jesus liveth, and that his throne shall ever stand. I know, I know. reading this morning comes from 1st John chapter 5 verses 11 through 13 that's 1st John chapter 5 verses 11 through 13 and I am reading from the New American Standard and it reads and the testimony is this that God has given us eternal life and his life is in his son he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son, 
of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I want you to picture in your mind that you are in the airport getting ready to board your flight. And as you're there, you'll notice that there are two kinds of people, passengers, if you will. There are those who have confirmed tickets, and then there are those who are on standby. And it's easy to tell which one is which, because those that have confirmed tickets are relaxed. They are talking with other people, they are reading a newspaper, maybe on their phones. But those who are on standby, they're anxiously standing around the ticket counter. They're pacing the floor. They're hoping that they can get on that flight. The difference between the two is the confidence factor. This morning we're going to talk about salvational assurance. And we're going to try to answer the question that if we should die in the next few minutes, are we right with God? And hopefully this morning that we can raise our confidence factor so that we can be able to enjoy this thing called salvational assurance. Sadly, a lot of folks are out there living with their fingers crossed. Some are out there even dying with their fingers crossed. And this is something that we truly need to know. Our lesson this morning will have two parts. Why we don't have this assurance and how we can become more confident. What are some of the stumbling blocks to our salvational assurance? Why do we not have this peace-giving confidence? One reason is that we doubt that we don't know that we could know. I'll say that again. Sometimes we doubt that we don't know that we could know. It was Paul that had this confidence, and he expressed this confidence in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. For I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. In Romans 8, Paul wrote about that security in verse 1. And here it tells us why he and so we also can be confident. That there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The scripture that Rusty read, 1 John chapter 5, also speaks of our salvational confidence. And we're not advocating a once saved, always saved. But if it is in our heart, and it is our true desire to follow in the footsteps of Christ, and we continue to do so with all of our mind, even though we fail often, we can have this confidence. For Jesus said in John 3 and verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his own one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not, shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, it's these scriptures that tell us that we can know we have eternal life that we can be sure of our salvation. But secondly, there are those who are unsure of their salvation because they depend on their feelings. <coughs> they felt saved when they come up out of that water of baptism. But as life continues, they're not sure because they've lost that feeling. Friends, our salvation is not based on personal feelings. 
if we are flying on a plane at 35,000 feet and something goes wrong with that plane, it doesn't make any difference how we feel. We are in danger. Those folks who went to work in those Twin Towers on 9-11, they felt safe going to work. Those planes came anyway. We all feel safe here this morning. But so have other worshipers in the past. And murderous gunmen have come into their assembly. Feelings alone cannot be trusted. Feelings at times fly to us. Feelings that are not based in truth can't be trusted. Jesus said in John 8 verse 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. <laughs> but he also in John 17, 17, prayed for his disciples, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. And John also reminds us of 1 John 1 and verse 17. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Sure, we can know that we are saved, but not by our personal feelings but by obeying, living in, walking in his truth, his word. And thirdly, a lot of our doubt has to do with our own failings. There are a lot of folks out there that believe that their works are going to save them. We sometimes hope that come judgment day, that our works will outweigh our sins. We hope that we will be saved by our goodness. D.L. Moody was an evangelist many, many years ago. And he held a revival meeting. And after the one meeting, a man came up to him and said that he didn't believe that he had enough faith. He didn't think that he had done enough good works. So Moody asked him who it is that he didn't have faith in. He said, are you doubting God or are you doubting Jesus Christ? And the man said, no, 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 it's not that. He says, I'm doubting myself. And Moody said to him, well, you're not the one who's going to save you. Most certainly the scriptures tell us that we must do good works. We must do the works that God has prepared for us to do. But it also teaches us that we are to be eager and zealous and excited about doing these works. Amen. That God will give us the power Amen. and the ability to do them. <coughs> but these works are done because of our gratitude for what Christ has done for us. Because God's love compels us to do these things, not because of the work themselves. As Paul writes in Ephesians 2 and verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that one may boast. We can't merit, we can't earn our salvation. We can't save ourselves by doing good deeds. And if we're relying on ourselves for our salvational confidence, we're never going to have the blessed assurance that we sing about. We cannot allow these misunderstandings to rob us of our salvational confidence and assurance. So how do we enhance our confidence? How do we get these things turned around? We're going to do this in the form of a test. You don't have to answer. But think about these things. The first test has to do with our obedience. 
And it comes from 1 John chapter 2 and verses 3 through 6. 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. And whoever abides, says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way as he walked. <clears throat> now John isn't saying here that our confidence in, is in living a perfect and sinless life. Because he said earlier that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But what John is saying is that we must, to the very best of our abilities and with all of our might, strive to make Jesus Christ our Lord and King. Everything that Jesus taught, every example he shown must reign in our hearts. And we must each and every day strive to be more like him. We all struggle with sin to one degree or another. But we must not allow that sin to rule our lives. We try to live right. We try to fight against the attitudes that cause us to sin. But you see, we're not alone. The most powerful evangelist the world has ever known struggled with this too. Paul tells us that in Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 24. Paul said, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive of the law of sin that dwells in my limbs. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Sounds just like me. Sounds just like each and every one of us. We struggle, we battle back and forth. We try to do our very best, but sometimes the members succeed and the mind fails. Now contrast to what John writes in 1 John chapter 3, in verses 8 and 9. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he is born of God. What John is saying is that the one that belongs to Christ can't continually live in sin. Will they sin? Yes. Will all of our friends out there, when we do something wrong, call us hypocrites because we go to church but yet we sin? We're not perfect people. A church is not a place for perfect people. Because there was only one perfect person. Only one that ever walked this earth. We cannot give up our struggle. We cannot give in to the fleshly desires. Friends, we need to keep both of our feet on God's side of the fence. We can't put one side and straddle that fence. We can't put both feet in the world and claim to be his. Test two. Do we love other Christians? 1 John 2, verses 9 through 11. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. 
Friends want to have a different kind of love for not one another than we do for those who are outside of God. Yes, we have this certain feeling of camaraderie, maybe with our neighbors and our, our co-workers and things like this, because we might share the same interests or even have the same values. But friends, they're supposed to be a special kind of love for the brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a love that tells us that we belong to the family of God. And that we are on our way home together. As Paul alludes to this thought in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 5 through 8. You know, it was here that he said it was shameful for a brother in Christ to take another brother to court. He was embarrassing the church. Friends, we're supposed to be different. We're family. We're to treat one another differently regardless of our differences. We're going to have trouble with our confidence, with our assurance of salvation as long as we harbor bad feelings or grudges against a brother or sister in Christ. Test three. Does the Spirit of God dwell in us? 1 John chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. And whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God abides in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. <clears throat> Have you noticed a pattern here? John, in these two verses, reviews our two previous thoughts. That we are to obey his commandments and allow him to be our Lord and King in our lives. And two, that we love one another with a special love. And now he is telling us that all these things can happen through the enablement of God's Spirit living in us. In Ephesians 1 and verses 13 and 14, the Bible reads in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. To the praise of his glory. We talk about confidence, about assurance. This is the ultimate proof of our salvation. Paul writes in Romans 8, and verses 14 through 17, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Jesus Christ. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. What kind of lifestyle does the Spirit lead us in? Find it in Galatians 5 and verses 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the life that we are living. Friends, we know we can be saved. We know we are saved. That we're heaven bound. I hope we can leave here this morning knowing that our election is sure. That our calling is sure. That we do have that home, that mansion, that room that Jesus has prepared is waiting for. We don't have to be on our deathbed and wonder 
Did I do enough? Did I work enough? <coughs> we can know. There is no doubt. The only doubts that one would have is if they're not a child of God. And you seriously need to consider those doubts. <clears throat> when we sit there and we read our Bible, when we read the New Testament, with the exception of the first five books of the New Testament, the rest are all letters to who? Those who are in Christ. To the churches, to the brethren. They're not letters to the unbelievers. They're letters to help us become better. But in order for those letters to have meaning to us, you have to be in Christ. And that opportunity this morning is happening right now. You have that opportunity to be in Christ. To have the Spirit dwell in you, to give you that salvational confidence and assurance that you will have that holy heaven when that great day comes. Through repentance and confession through baptism in the watery grave to wash your sins away, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. And if you are a child of God and you just need our prayers and you need to make things right with God in a public way, we want to give you that opportunity also as together we stand and we sing. <coughs> Sinners Jesus will receive, sound this word of grace to all, who the heavenly pathway leave, all who linger, all who fall, sing it all and o'er again.
Most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings that you have given us. We're thankful for our health and our strength. We're thankful for the time that we've had to come here this morning to sing songs of praises unto thee, to hear a portion of thy word spoken of. We pray that each and every one of us that listen attentively to what was said this morning, that we have done enough that have a home in heaven with you. We pray that you would be with our shut-ins, the ones that have been mentioned sick, that they may return to their health and be back with us. We pray that you would be with the ones that are traveling, that they may have a safe journey to and from their destination. We pray that you would always watch over us, that you would guide, guard, direct us throughout our lives, and that you would forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.